Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, welcome. Uh, so we're here for another Vaccination Database Seminar Series, our, our talk. Today we're excited to have uh, Hussein and Alex from uh, Google BigQuery team. Alex is currently a senior staff manager, staff, staff engineer at Google, leading the overall uh, BigQuery project. Um, and we have a PhD from uh, UIUC, but not in databases, in IoT devices. And Alex has been, is a uh, technical lead at the Google BigQuery project. Um, and he spent 13 years working on SQL Server at, at Microsoft prior to joining Google. So with that, uh, take away guys, I'm happy, happy for you to be here. And as always, for the audience, if you have any questions for Alex or Hussein as they're giving the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from, and feel free to interrupt at any time. We want this to be a conversation and not just them talking to the black void that is Zoom. Okay? With that, guys, go for it. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Andy, for the introductions. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Hussein, uh, and I'm joined uh, by Alex Serna. Uh, to talk about query processing in Google BigQuery, we are very excited to, to share some of the details of how BigQuery does query execution and query processing. So to start, let me give you a little bit of overview of what Google BigQuery is. It is a serverless, highly scalable, and cost-effective data warehouse, uh, cloud data warehouse. And uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have several uh, growing cloud data warehouses, uh, things that are really uh, distinct about BigQuery and uh, really uh, kind of powerful characteristics of BigQuery. One is it's a fully managed uh, serverless and clusterless service. Uh, users don't need to uh, set up or provision servers or clusters. They could just come into this um, service and if they want, they can um, reserve resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But everything we see scales up and down depending on the workload and, and storage demands. Um, it's a 24-7 service with uh, four nines of uptime availability. Um, users are, uh, rely on a predictable performance from the system because these are uh, the queries running in the system are uh, used in really critical um, reporting or business intelligence uh, uh, applications. Um, in terms of a scale, it's a petabyte scale storage and, and query system. We often have customers that, uh, that store data at that scale and query uh, data at that scale. Uh, everything is encrypted. Everything is uh, durably stored. Uh, it provides real-time analytics on streaming data uh, for an, a lot of uh, real-time uh, analytics use cases. Um, the main interaction, obviously, this is a kind of a SQL system. So uh, it's going to be uh, through SQL. But uh, we tried really hard to make sure this is an easy to use uh, SQL interface. And it doesn't require any hints, any fine tuning. So everything uh, kind of is, is taken care of uh, by BigQuery. And we have also embedded a lot of features into this uh, you know, SQL interface. For example, we have machine learning primitives within SQL that are um, kind of really powerful and really useful for analysts to, um, to do various jobs that are not traditionally as part of their data warehousing and data analytics um, SQL workflow. Um, so how, how do we do that? Uh, this is kind of a high level architecture of uh, what BigQuery looks like. It's a decoupled storage and compute system. Um, we have a distributed replicated storage, uh, you know, um, that, that, that kind of spans across multiple machines and storage devices in a Google data center. And on the right hand side, we have a, a highly available compute uh, deployment. And basically the compute nodes can talk to storage nodes through a, uh, uh, Google petabit network infrastructure that's available in Google data centers. And also in between, we have a distributed memory shuffle tier that's highly used to communicate between the compute nodes. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, that's a key part of um, basically query execution in BigQuery. Um, to interact with the system, users can run queries using SQL. Uh, you know, it's a 2011 compliant SQL. Uh, there are REST APIs, and then there's a web UI and uh, command line interfaces. And then there are client libraries in various languages that are used to programmatically uh, 
access the, uh, the BigQuery service, ODBC, JDBC drivers, and, and various connectors uh, as well. And also, in order to get the data in and out, you know, there are uh, streaming ingestion and reading uh, APIs uh, to uh, read and write data at uh, very high throughput and high scale. Uh, there's also bulk load and export uh, functionalities on the storage side. Um, if I want to iterate over some of the high-level key architecture design principles for BigQuery, uh, there is a combination of three things that makes BigQuery really successful at delivering some of those uh, functionalities I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, one of that is storage and compute separation. We know that from uh, various uh, industry-leading um, uh, you know, systems that this helps a lot with getting to larger scale, petabyte scale of compute and storage. Um, it makes systems highly available um, because fault, fault can be tolerated at, at different layers uh, independently. And also it helps a lot with serverless and multi-tenancy because resources can be isolated, uh, you know, scaled independently. Um, so this is a key point to enable those functionalities. Uh, this is combined with the really good use of co-location and caching across you know, various um, storage systems and networking systems that really gives us a high performance at the lowest, uh, at low cost, even though there is, there is a storage and compute separation. And then the third thing here is really integrated hardware and software stack. Uh, BigQuery can take advantage of you know, Google technology, the, the hardware technology and data center technology to get really great performance in terms of storage uh, and network and, and data transfer. So with that high level overview, we're gonna uh, do a little bit of more uh, of a deep dive into query execution. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex to talk about query execution basics. Hi everybody. <clears throat> uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about how BigQuery optimizes queries and some details about how BigQuery runs them how we distribute resources between running queries. Uh, first of all, a little bit of uh, terminology, which could be unusual. Uh, in BigQuery, project or reservation denotes a pool of resources available to workload. And in the cloud, of course, we have you know, various way to kind of quickly to shrink or grow that you know, resource pool. For example, BigQuery can do that with one minute granularity. Uh, for simplicity in discussions, we're going to assume that you know, we have just fixed pool of resources available, which is kind of quite common configuration basically for many users. <clears throat> um, so now about BigQuery query processing goals. Of course, we have a goal to run queries quickly and efficiently, but besides that, we also have a goal of trying to achieve more predictable query performance whenever possible. Uh, as Hossein mentioned, BigQuery has a SLA of four nines to put that into perspective. Essentially, the goal is to have just one minute a week of downtime if averaged. Uh, such high SLA is definitely suitable for critical workloads, but then if you're running critical workload, it's also important you know, to finish queries on time by deadline. So again, we also need to invest in as much predictable performance as possible, and this affected some of the algorithms and designs. Uh, so let's go back to the topic of how queries run. Uh, query is executed using multiple stages. Typical of example of stages, you know, some, uh, for example, we scan local table, we do some filtering on top of that, and then we do basically uh, partial aggregation. Each stage consists of tasks. Task is unit of work to be done. Tasks are assigned to workers and workers then can process tasks. Uh, so stage is done when all tasks are done. Uh, then another stage could become unblocked and we can start another stage to execution. Uh, you know, multiple stages could be running at the same time. <clears throat> uh, you know, again, typical example, you know, if for example, stage needs to filter aggregation results, so that stage would need to wait before aggregation is done and then it, that stage could be start to execute. Number of stages in query is not fixed and sometimes could change depending on data distribution. But overall rule of thumb is that you know each aggregation probably requires one stage and each join adds one or two stages and so on. Um, so basically in this slide, we see example of, of basically 
uh, of simple query which requires two stages. In first stage, we do table scan, filtering, then local aggregation, and then second stage computes final count. Next slide, please. Okay, here I'm going to mention some interesting uh, facts about how BigQuery runs queries. So BigQuery tries to keep data in memory during query processing if possible. That is, if you are running a medium-sized query in an idle project, meaning you have some idle set of resources, uh, medium size is something, and we consider that query medium size is something that processes, for example, one terabyte of data, then quite likely intermediate data will never be stored on disk or not even on SSD until we finally persist query results. So basically, BigQuery tries to do memory processing whenever it's possible. Uh, we will go into more details about dynamic scheduling later, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, query is executed using multiple stages and each stage has multiple tasks. Number of workers that process those tasks is very flexible and can change in matter of seconds from anywhere from one worker to many thousands of workers. Um, about failure recovery, so stage tasks could be restarted or executed speculatively. This helps to maintain high performance, even if we have rare hardware problems in a highly distributed environment. So for example, if one of the computers becomes less responsive, we do not have to wait a long time till we decide we have a real problem or not. We could instead simply speculatively uh, start task execution in another location, even after slight delay. This is why hardware problems won't affect query performance. Can so can any say, so Yeah, so for the okay. second of work, can you say what percentage of the tasks across the entire BigQuery fleet are executed speculatively and uh, were incorrect? Like there's a hiccup in the network or something and you think you know, a node is down, but it's really okay. So you start speculatively executing the work, but it turns out you, you wasted that because the, the node came back right away or, you know what I mean? I don't think it's very large. It's mostly uh, extremely large queries that require basically, you know, uh, some duplicate executions of some of the tasks. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not a very big fraction of, of things. Okay. okay. Any additional questions so far? Again, queries consist of stages, stage of tasks, tasks executed by workers. <clears throat> And so you're, you're talking about the, the scheduling stuff later on, right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll, I'll hold up my questions for that later. Okay. Hussein, next slide, please. Um, this slide illustrates various components that, that, that are involved in query processing. It also shows how stages interact with each other. Each stage reads data from either a distributed file system or from a distributed component called shuffle. And we will talk about shuffle in more details. All work for a given query is coordinated using, you know, coordinator. There is also a scheduler component that helps to assign tasks to workers. So on this slide, you see stage one reading data from the distributed file system and processing it. And then it puts intermediate results into shuffle. The next stage two will read data from shuffle, process it again, and put again partial intermediate results into shuffle and so on. In summary, each stage usually reads data from distributed file system or from shuffle, and then usually puts results back into a shuffle. So looks like this shuffle component is very important. So what exactly it is? Next slide, please. Um, so Shuffle is essentially very fast and very highly available storage combined with data repartitioning engine. Shuffle not only stores data, but also, for example, can hash partition it. And as we know, hash partitioning is a very common operation in distributed query processing. If you want to compute aggregation, we usually hash partition data on aggregation keys. If you want to perform join, you know, between two large tables, usually we need to hash partition inputs by join keys. So shuffle component does exactly that. So besides storing intermediate results between stages, it also partitions data. Um, shuffle generally tries to keep all data in memory, but of course, if intermediate data sizes becomes very large, then it could write you know, those intermediate results into distributed file system. All this process is 
quite fast and in many cases it's actually hard to tell whether the data was in, in memory or you know some of the data uh, ended up basically on disk so any questions about shuffle i believe there's a question on chat um someone asked uh, what happens when a server dies do you need to restart or like a do map reduce query continues and uh, alex could elaborate on that one but basically we use this Shuffle as an intermediate um, persistence layer, like uh, MapReduce or Hadoop, basically to recover work that uh, needs to be restarted. And it's at the task level, so not the whole stage needs to be restarted. Yeah, so for the most part, uh, you would never notice any, like, there could be significant, quite significant uh, problems with hardware, and you wouldn't even notice that query would not even slow down let alone be canceled. OK, next stage. Oh, next uh, slide, please. Right, so if, if people have questions, you know, instead of typing in the chat, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask them. Oh, OK. I just sometimes do, do not know that. No, you're, you're fine. It's, I'm telling tell the audience. So as far as you, are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, so is there any parameters for handling the shuffle partitions or BigQuery does that behind the scene based on uh, something? Because we have traditionally seen in distributed things that based on the data load or too much of you know skewness of data or doing the broadcasting, we feel we have to handle by use case by use case this partition parameter. It was BigQuery does that by intelligent looking at the data or? Yeah, so we have actually many slides, uh, you know, uh, discussing how exactly we partition data. So we'll go into okay. those details. Okay. All right, Javi, do you have a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So in your serverless environment, uh, so you do parallelism across servers, but in a given server, do you have a special parallelism for multi-core? Like you got 32 cores and do you have anything special for that? Uh, yes. So basically, it depends of what kind of workloads you're running, BI or, or, or data warehousing. But we definitely use more than one thread, basically, to process uh, tasks. Yeah, because uh, in multi-core, also, you need to shuffle data across. So do you use the multi-node uh, shuffle, or this is something special? Again, it's slightly different depending uh, basically where we're using essentially a business intelligence engine or a regular. But, uh, you know, there are st still other things that you can process in parallel depending basically, you know, on, on query shape and stage shape. Okay, okay so... Um, Let's go into next topic. OK. Uh, so in BigQuery, one can have different size reservations and pro or projects. Uh, so essentially, again, uh, to remind, this is a set of resources. The slot represents some fixed set of resources available for query processing in reservation or in project. Uh, these resources could be CPU, worker, RAM, shuffle RAM, networking, and so on. If you compare 500 slot reservation, for example, versus 2,000 slot reservation, then the uh, second one is going to have four times more resources dedicated to query processing. So essentially, usually we do not measure uh, you know, a resource pool size using number of computers. We measure it in... Uh, using a virtual description of resources committed to that reservation. Uh, the more slots we have, the faster queries will run. <clears throat> so typical configuration, you know, like most common configuration for reservation is 2,000 slots, let's say. Uh, and it maps to some number of computers. We just don't kind of distinguish that number. Um, so when queries run, sometimes some of the query stages do not need many workers simply because there is little data to process. System is able very quickly to take away workers from queries that do not need them. System is also able very quickly to redistribute workers between queries in flight to make sure each query gets fair share. So for example, if one query finished, then immediately the rest of the queries could start using additional workers 
and then they run faster. This could happen as soon as next second. Or if new query was submitted, then a small fraction of workers is going to be taken away from each already executing query and assigned to the new query. Again, every query gets own fair share of workers. Uh, this fluid resource distribution is important uh, for more predictable query execution inside the busy system. So if you think in terms of how much resources every query gets, it is clear that dedicated resources correlate with average reservation load and not with how busy system reservation was at the time query arrived. Uh, so imagine typical scenario where a few independent pipelines are performing calculations um, by running series of queries. Pipelines are independent, so there is no coordination between the moments we submit queries. So if we were, for example, to queue queries or if we were to lock in resources allocated to query at the time query arrived, then system performance would be much less predictable because performance frequently would depend on luck, whether a particular pipeline query arrived in front or behind another large query from another pipeline. And then it gets, you know, sometimes more dedicated resources, sometimes less dedicated resources. Because of this flexible resource distribution, that is much less important here. Essentially, you know, we get more predictable performance because each query gets a fraction of resources, which is averaged over the time a query was running. So any questions about this? <clears throat> Um, yeah, is there any mechanism for a user to override the default of fair distribution so that they could prioritize queries? Jose, do you want to answer that one? So there are some mechanisms in terms of uh, reservation controls today that uh, uh, BigQuery provides in terms of how resources are allocated between multiple reservations. Um, so there is some of that, but, um, you know, there are tons of workload management features that you know we've been working on to not exactly maybe uh, do it as you mentioned, but to have some kind of um, control over how things are uh, prioritized over each other. So um, th that's something that we've been looking into as well. Thanks. Yes, essentially there are quite a few options to adjust this algorithm which they described, but you know, key idea is that you have quite a lot of flexibility to transfer resources from one query to another very quickly. Next slide, please. May I ask a question? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I'm not sure whether I missed this earlier, but could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by this fair? It's like you are going to estimate the required resource for each query and then distribute it, uh, distribute your slots accordingly. Uh, which is basically just what, what could you elaborate a little bit on this concept of fair and how that's decided? Okay, so if we have five queries running simultaneously, we will try to make sure that every query gets same, you know, CPU time, uh, you know, per unit of time, for example. Uh, it depends on your reservation size, but we'll essentially try to make sure that approximately same resources uh, I used to execute each of the five queries. Regardless of how big those queries may be? Yes, regardless how big those queries might be. Okay, got it, sure, thank you. If I, if I can add to that, uh, you asked, you know, estimating the number of the slots or resource usage beforehand. We have, um, you know, algorithms there to kind of monitor the query execution and figure out um, how, how resource use, usage has been kind of evolving over time and adjusting based on that. So it's a lot of uh, dynamic, uh, you know, allocation of resources uh, over time. Um, so that, that's why it doesn't require to estimate that uh, from the beginning. I see. Yeah, thanks for the explanation. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about BigQuery Query Optimizer. Um, so uh, Query Optimizer was implemented uh, uh, basically from scratch as part of Dremel development at Google. It uses both cost and rule-based optimizations to produce an optimal query plan. Uh, so do you have any special goals for Query Optimizer besides performance, efficiency, and query predictability? 
so one of the additional goals was, you know, increased focus on handling nested data like structures and arrays. It just basically uh, quite convenient to have, you know, very native support for arrays and, and, and basically and structures. Um, so what are examples of cost and rule-based optimizations that BigQuery does? Um, so a good example of cost-based optimization is materialized view choice. In, in BigQuery, one can define materialized views that, for example, hold pre-aggregated data. Materialized view could have clustering columns defined. Uh, so essentially data in materialized view will be sorted by these columns. So when query optimizer trying to find most optimal materialized view to use, it needs to take a look at data filtering involved and how data was clustered so it can find materialized view with an estimated minimal amount of or minimal number of rows to scan. And this is exactly what it does. Um, what about rule-based optimizations? So of course, everybody knows now simplest rule-based optimization usually is filter push down. We always try to execute filters as well as possible. Another good example of rule-based optimization is partial aggregation. BigQuery always prefers to uh, do partial aggregation before final aggregation because it helps to reduce possible data skew uh, by the time you need to hash partition data by aggregation keys. Uh, so this way, query processing time is less sensitive to data skew and more predictable. And again, data skew is frequently very difficult to predict up front. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So for the optimizer, can you say anything about like, is it you know, the classic KISS cascades top bottom or, or, or system R bottom top? No, it's, an, it's not based on uh, cascade ADS. Uh, in, so in data analytics workloads, uh, it, it, they have some uh, specific, uh, which sometimes now you, you can do essentially things uh, a little bit more, I guess, in simpler way. And, but we have uh, many other interesting things happening with query optimization. So uh, let's go maybe to okay. the slide. Well, uh, can I ask one question? Yes. Um, sure, this is, uh, this is Rebecca Taff from Cockroach Labs. And um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that you're doing some interesting things with support for arrays and other types of structures. Are you gonna talk more about that? Um, so I don't know if you saw some papers about Dremel originally, like, uh, you know, uh, quite frequently people like uh, to do the normalized data for extremely large data sizes. If you think something like petabyte in size, frequently, you know, at that scale, it's uh, even hard to normalize data or you may not have enough time to do that. Uh, so for these particular scenarios, extremely large data scales, sometimes it's useful to have good native support of kind of nested denormalized data, just because again, a UATL process could become extremely expensive if, if you go at all data scales. So when you say nested support, are these things like inverted indexes and, and things like that or? No, I meant like uh, you can have some, uh, columns that have repeated data inside like arrays and each array element in turn can have like structures inside. We have multiple fields and that field again can have some arrays. So basically some deeply nested data, which is stored in a in, in single table. Got it, thanks. Okay, so let's talk beyond uh, basically uh, rule-based and cost-based optimizations. <clears throat> so, BigQuery also has optimization that it does in the middle of query processing. Uh, this is because frequently queries are auto-generated by various tools and are quite complex and it's difficult to reliably estimate a data distribution, let's say after 10 joins. Upfront, card upfront cardinality estimates have errors that grow exponentially with query complexity. In addition, those errors could be quite sensitive to parameter values or data size changes or various statistics uh, that are collected. For example, BigQuery has two different algorithms to run analytical function row number with over clause, which contains order by clause. One works well with small partitions and another works well with large partitions. If we were to use estimates to make algorithm choice up front, uh, 
not only choice could be suboptimal, but because estimation error could keep changing, we may end up switching from one query plan to another back and forth, resulting in less predictable query performance overall. So instead, what we do is we uh, observe and monitor data sizes in real time as we process data. And then we can change query plan as needed based on these observations. <coughs> um, let me see. Um, so by, by now, I mentioned a few times that we are trying to make query performance more predictable whenever we can. I already mentioned uh, partial aggregation that helps make query processing less sensitive to data skew. Another example is broadcast joins. Uh, Votes have less penalty, you know, in case of skewed joins, and uh, uh, BigQuery prefers to run broadcast joins wherever it can. Uh, and we will go into even more details in the next slide. <coughs> next slide, please. Um, so, what examples are of query plan adjustments that BigQuery can do in the middle of a query running? Uh, first of all, parallelism level. BigQuery can change query parallelism depending on data size. Say initially we estimated we need to aggregate one terabyte of data, but then it appears that amount of data is going to be larger, more like 10 terabytes, for example. Intuitively, if we have additional workers available, then we should use them because the amount of work went up. And this is exactly what happens in BigQuery. Another example of changes to query plan uh, that we do dynamically is uh, we could switch between broadcast join and shuffle join. Uh, so BigQuery runs two kinds of joins. Shuffle joins in, is when we hash partition both join sites, and then each worker gets own partition to process. And broadcast join is when one of the join sites is small, then we can broadcast it to every worker. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with both join flavors. Um, so broadcast joins have some nice properties. They're less sensitive to join skew and usually faster, especially when broadcasted table is very small. So ideally, we should use broadcast join whenever we can. And this is exactly what happens in BigQuery. We measure observed data size in the middle of a query and uh, basically in the middle of the query that we are processing and then we decide and we can actually change join flavor on the fly. And again, it doesn't depend at all on query complexity. It works with extremely complex queries. <clears throat> and um, yet another example of query plan change that we could do is basically a, a row number analytical function, as I mentioned, you know, we have two different algorithms to process it, you know, when it requires sorting and uh, we would measure basically data size uh, on the fly and then we would decide which one algorithm to activate and uh, you know for which partitions <clears throat> so any questions related to kind of dynamic query plan adjustments and uh, jose in the, in the next slides will go in many more details how exactly these adjustments are uh, happening yeah, so this this is Hamid. So the, do you also uh, change uh, during the runtime the join method? Like, you know, if you use hash join, sometimes it runs out of memory. So for those blocks, you may want to change to the sorting that join because you have much more control on the memory. This is something that actually Presto does. So we don't use sort-based joins, uh, but we definitely, you know, pay attention to data sizes. And uh, again, like you don't need to worry about which one join flavor we will run. You will never run, you know, out of memory or anything. Uh, query will complete, uh, you know, always successfully. And again, we will choose join, you know, based on looking on uh, what kind of data sizes we get and data distribution. And uh, so, in, in many cases, we try to use broadcast join if we can, but if we cannot, you know, we'll run shuffle join. Yeah, so that I understand. My point was that for some blocks, you will be using hash join, and for some mm -hmm. blocks, you will be using sort merge join. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, sort merge, no, we're not using sort merge join, no. So how do you avoid the skews due to hash uh, overflow? So 
broadcast joints usually don't need any special handling. Uh, shuffle joints do need usually special handling. I think you could say you, you rec it's like the classic textbook recursive partitioning, right? If you if you overflow the bucket, you just partition partition it again. Yes. So uh, Hossein will go into some details how we basically deal with large hash buckets. Okay. We have dedicated slides about it. Okay. Okay, so now Hossein will continue from here. All right, thanks, Alex. So uh, with that kind of high-level overview of dynamic uh, query optimizations, uh, I'm going to go through some examples and some of the uh, kind of basic operations that we do here. I hope that I would be able to answer some of those questions as well. So let's start with an aggregation example here. We have a query that uh, tries to do a group by operation. And uh, you know the the dynamic partitioning algorithm is really aimed at uh, being able to, in a scalable way, execute this uh, distributed aggregation without having any statistics and any knowledge about the kind of the input to the operation. So let's say we start with um, some workers running the first stage of this query and doing some partial group by locally uh, from the uh, input table. And then uh, they start to actually do some uh, shuffle. Basically, we want to do a partition by uh, a, a dynamic partitioning based on the key, the group by key, and then do a group by locally. So that's how we get the distributed group by running. Um, but this shuffle needs to have some notion of dynamic partitioning in it because we want to optimize the level of parallelism and the number of nodes participating in the um, consuming side of this shuffle operation when we want to compute the group by output. And I'll talk about that more in the next slide. But after that uh, shuffling with dynamic partitioning is done, data is actually distributed based on the group by key across the set of workers that can now do the final aggregation um, for, for each of these key groups. And then they perform the, um, uh, the sort and limit operations on top of that as well. And then finally, the results are com uh, combined in a worker uh, with the final sort and limit to get the final like 100 top results uh, out and back to the customer. So let me go through that shuffle the dynamic partitioning operation. And then I'll pause if you have any questions on this, this particular um, algorithm. So dynamic partitioning is really a key kind of a core critical part of the BigQuery dynamic query execution. The goal of it is to dynamically load balance and adjust parallelism every time we have a shuffle, op shuffle operation. Um, assuming that there is nothing known about the input to these operations because it's hard to estimate, um, you know, filter effectiveness or cardinalities or things like that, we have this powerful primitive that can always adapt uh, the execution. So let's go through the, through an example and see how it works. We have two workers producing some data. They start to write data into two partitions. These are hash-based buckets, basically. And you know, going back to that skew example, a lot of times one of these partitions will get a lot more data than the other one. So in this case, the partition number two gets a lot of data. And uh, while the query is running, while the stage is running, the query coordinator detects that there is this skew in terms of the partitions. And um, on the fly, basically, uh, directs workers to actually change the way they partition the data and use two new partitions, partition three and four, to further um, divide the, the data into, into more partitions. And they basically stop writing to that partition two and start to write into partitions three and four. So as the query and the stage basically progresses, more data gets into those partitions. And finally, the data that we previously wrote into partition two gets repartitioned into the new partitions, partition three and four. So at the end of the query execution, uh, partitions one, three, and four, sorry, I shouldn't say query execution, stage execution, we have uh, the data in those three partitions. Any questions so far? Yeah, so what do you do with the aggregate distinct? Do you still do the same thing? Because you have to remember what you have counted, you shouldn't count anymore. Like so count this operation, sound distinct. So any any aggregate uh, hash based aggregate operation that runs in a distributed way uh, 
can be built on top of this operation. So um, you, what we want at this stage is create a partitioning that is kind of load balanced and um, you know kind of roughly equal across these partitions. What we do on top of that, which is you know an aggregate, whether it's a count distinct or something like that, can be done. Um, can be done basically independently because these partitions don't overlap. The, the key here is that that partition two, the data there gets repartitions in, repartitioned to three and four. So the same data doesn't appear um, when we consume it at the next stage or next level. Uh, there, there will be no duplicate keys. The keys are gets repartitioned into those two partitions. Uh, hi, Hossein. I have one question. So if, if the clustering is enabled on this table, along with this partition. So how does this uh, worker handle that? Let's say on, a, on your earlier query, let's say I wanted to look at based on state like California or Georgia, if you put it on mm -hmm. the web clause. So I think I hear that BigQuery recommends to put clustering when, when this kind of, you know, uh, very uh, distinct values are pretty high, like the state or gender, whatever, right? how does it balance this partitioning with clustering? So that is a gr great question. So when you have clustering and you have your, for example, aggregation uh, or filter on the clustered uh, column, what you see is that your input workers that are processing the data can aggressively uh, do the partial aggregation and produce a tiny amount of data that actually needs to be shuffled through the dynamic partitioning. And that's where this dynamic partitioning works pretty well because if the data is already uh, partitioned properly for that type of distributed operation, you produce, uh, you know, the query produces a little bit of data and all of that sometimes just gets aggregated into one worker and then sent back. So it, a lot of work is saved uh, through that. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move on to a join example now. We talked about broadcast and shuffle join. And one of the key parts of the dynamic join execution is to decide between um, the, the two join methods. Um, so the broadcast join, and this is a, a simple diagram, a simple query that shows that if one side of join is much smaller than the other one, the worker, in this case, a single worker reads that, uses the same shuffle primitive to actually send the data, transfer the data to the workers that are probing the probe side of the join and uh, building a hash table based on the broadcast side and then uh, aggregate the result uh, uh, finally. Um, similarly, a shuffle join, a parallel shuffle join basically uses a shuffle primitive on both sides uh, when we want to uh, actually co-partition the data on the same partitioning keys and then have workers reading from left side and right uh, hand side um, partitions uh, aligned together and, and then compute the join. Uh, and this is in this case a hash join uh, and then uh, aggregate the results at the end and send it back. So, so these are the two different execution graphs for broadcast versus shuffle join. But what happens in reality is that we don't know beforehand uh, about the size of these two tables. So we need to dynamically go from one to the other. Now I'm going to throw an example to show how that works. Um, before getting into that, the, the, the dynamic join algorithm needs to make multiple decisions, and those are very important in performance of join. Um, one of the advantages of broadcast join, as Alex mentioned, is that uh, in terms of data skew, there is usually no performance penalty. And also it, also, uh, it transfers much less data in most of the cases compared to the shuffle join. So it's very important to find the right uh, join algorithm. Uh, also, we need to decide uh, on the number of partitions and workers uh, when we want to do the join. And the dynamic partitioning algorithm that I mentioned earlier is very useful here. Uh, the dynamic join also needs to coordinate across multiple joins and sometimes swap join sides, uh, depending on the sizes and uh, shapes uh, of the join. And uh, a, a pattern that's very common in data warehouses is the star schema joins, where there's a fact table being joined uh, with a uh, lot of dimension tables. That's called the star schema. And um, our optimizer uh, is able to detect such joins and then do a constraint propagation, basically 
compute constraints from the dimensions on one side and propagate them to the uh, fact table, those predicates, such that the fact table is heavily reduced before the join happens. And that helps with, um, whether it's a broadcast or a shuffle join, reducing the amount of data participating in the join phase. So with that, I'm going to go through an example of choosing the join algorithm through the dynamic join um, method. So in this case, we have two tables that are being joined on a key. Um, and uh, the dynamic query execution algorithm starts to run this um, stage, basically, that it scans both sides of the join and shuffle them. Um, so at this point, uh, the query coordinator doesn't know how big of a join it is or how big each sides of this join um, are. At some point, it detects that one side, T1, is too small. And this means that we don't need to shuffle both sides and run it as a shuffle join. We can actually run this query as a broadcast join. So what it does, it cancels the other side, the T2 side, um, so that it could scan it, probe T2, basically, and broadcast T1 into T2. So in this case, that uh, the same data that was shuffled um, is now read as a broadcast um, uh, through workers that are uh, doing a hash-based join uh, from the broadcast side to the probe side here. They compute the result, and then the result is sent back to the coordinator. Now, with the shuffle join case, the same thing might uh, happen. But uh, in this case, T1 and T2 might be both too large. Um, so the, the coordinator detects that case and uh, in the middle of the execution decides that this uh, joint cannot be executed as a broadcast joint. So it continues to run it as a partition joint and then um, basically schedules uh, the next stage, which does the shuffle hash join. Any questions? OK. So I'm going to go through a more complex example of dynamic query execution uh, to give you an idea of, you know, for more complex query plans, how we can uh, use uh, these dynamic query execution primitives to um, predictably run queries without having a lot of the statistics about the inputs. Um, this example is about computing a row number analytic function. Um, so in this case, we have a partition by clause potentially, and then we are uh, computing row number for, for those partitions. Uh, it's, it's an expensive operation because we require to sort data for those partition. And because of that, it's important to get the right level of parallelism. Um, however, it's a little bit challenging because when we partition the data, sometimes some of the partitions might get a lot more data than the other ones. And we want to be able to scale to that and kind of handle that um, skew in the partition sizes efficiently. So what BigQuery does is starts to scan the data, performs the hash-based partitioning to initially create a set of buckets, uh, the, the partition by buckets that are used uh, in the analytic function. Some of these partitions will be small. And the execution will be um, kind of uh, simple for those cases. The data is sorted locally within the workers reading that partition and then the row numbers are calculated. But for some of these partitions that are larger, we have uh, a secondary stage within the query execution. So as the query is running, a new uh, stage is added to the execution to do a range partition on top of the buckets that were created to do the hash partition. Basically, one of those partitions is now split into multiple partitions based on the uh, the ranges uh, of the uh, of the values that are sorted here, and then each of the uh, range partition buckets are sorted separately. Uh, so it's kind it kind of gives us a global order because these are range partition global in the sense of that particular partition the analytic function, and then the row numbers can be now calculated in parallel uh, across those workers. And finally, the results of uh, both small partition and large partitions. Uh, are kind of all combined and, and returned to the user. Any questions on this? So does it mean that one partition that uh, you need to put the row number on, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to the max, is really split across multiple? Then how do you compute the row number? 
So if you have, a, so this is kind of a, a distributed sort problem and you, and, and uh, computation of the row number. If you know, for example, how many rows you have in each of these buckets and these buckets are not overlapping in terms of ranges they are covering, you can create a global um, row ID, but you, you need to know how many rows. So the, the actual um, execution is even more complicated than this. It's not just a, um, you know, you distribute the data and immediately start uh, running uh, the, the row number calculation on top of that. You have to do a little bit of kind of communication and uh, uh, detection of how the, the rows are distributed across these buckets. But at the end, you have these ranges and each of them will have a known number of rows in them so that you can assign a row number to all of the data uh, in a distributed way. All right, um, so this is going to be our last slide. Um, so this is kind of a summary of what BigQuery uh, does in terms of query optimization. It, is, it uses a mix of cost-based, rule-based, and dynamic optimization. And we talked about why we really need to have a mix of all of these uh, to have a predictable performance for a very versatile workload. Um, the key to use uh, that uh, dynamic optimization algorithm is that uh, there are two things, really. One is that BigQuery's ability to collect real-time statistics and updating all of these operations um, in flight, mid-execution. So that is a key to, to do that dynamic partitioning or choosing the join method or doing this row number calculation, for example. And then the, the second key ability of BigQuery uh, to enable dynamic query execution is the fact that we can re-execute the small parts of the query uh, because uh, Shuffle creates this uh, kind of um, snapshot or um, checkpoint basically that we can go back and re-execute parts, uh, even the small tasks within the query. So that, that allows modification of a query plan really easily. Um, the dynamic optimizations we just talked about, when it's combined with that adaptive resource allocation that Alex talked about uh, in terms of resource, uh, allocation gives us that performance predictability uh, because now now we can uh, really depending on the shape of the query and the shape of the data provide kind of the same throughput and output uh, in terms of performance uh, and also it is a much more robust way of handling arbitrarily complex queries or data sets uh, without relying too much on things that might break easily in terms of the statistics so this concludes our talk. Um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, Alex and I would be happy to answer. OK, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I will, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have, if you have any questions for Alex or uh, Hussein, please unmute yourself and fire away. OK, this is Hamid again. <laughs> so uh, one thing over here is that you talked about your caching a little bit, your audience, you mentioned it. So how do you handle the brownout? That is, you lost the cache, and then now you have to go to the object store to get it, and it takes a while to do it. So is your past cache really persistent within the old cluster? Let me try to answer that. So in this execution model, I we didn't cover a lot of caching. Um, most of the time, the data can be read directly from the distributed storage. And this is relying on how Google built uh, the distributed storage system and uh, uh, the network infrastructure. So most of the time, without any caching, the performance of the storage system is um, pretty good. So the customers don't even see the difference. Caching is used in certain cases. For example, BigQuery supports result caching. Um, or in, for certain workloads, um, so, some other uh, in-memory caching for, for data. But those are really specific um, cases, uh, not, not in the general use case. Yeah, but the modern sub servers, uh, even Google published numbers, actually, if you use a local NVMe, the difference between that and even NVMe on the other side of the network is like order of magnitude. So it does make a big difference to go to your cache versus object store. It, you're right, but it depends on the type of workload we are talking about. In, especially when you're talking about large scale analytical workload, you have a lot of downstream operations such as shuffle 
every partitioning. And those are very expensive, orders of magnitude more expensive than the cost of a network round trip to NVMe, remote NVMe, for example, or remote disk. So in, in most practical use cases, what matters in query execution is the query plan, the amount of data that's uh, transferred over the network, not necessarily um, the first round trip to storage. But you have a good point. I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of those, and um, there are various techniques that are being used um, in, in certain cases within BigQuery to accelerate things as well. So this is Ling. Uh, so I have a little bit higher level question. I'm just wondering, um, so I think it's great to have the flexibility and adjust things uh, dynamically based on data sizes, et cetera, right? So but I'm just curious, have you guys considered um, to remember some of uh, the choices you have did uh, on a particular table for a particular query or subquery? So that the next time, if you see a similar thing, you don't need to do the adjustment dynamically again. I'm just curious, have you guys considered it or what's your thoughts on that? Alex, do you want to take that? It's definitely an interesting idea, um, but uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of this discussion, we're probably not going to cover that one. Uh, yeah, but uh, I can definitely see where you're coming from. You know, it could be an interesting discussion in the future. Okay, sure, thank you. All right, question from Ryan. Hi, I, I noticed that um, throughout this presentation, you mostly focused on a fixed number of slots. Um, are you investigating um, allowing projects to use more slots dynamically? Um, I, I don't know really what a slot means precisely, so maybe that doesn't make sense as a question, but um, I'll just let you run with that. Let me try to answer that. So a slot, when we talk about it, is really, you can think of it as a, as a unit of CPU, a virtual CPU unit, really. Um, and we are not, I mean, to clarify, queries go, um, can use dynamically however many slots uh, they need up to, depending on how the resource provisioning or resource commitment for a customer project works. For example, if there's a reservation up to, the, up to a certain limit. So nothing is really fixed here. Things change very dynamically in terms of how many uh, slots are being used by a query. Um, if your question is more about provisioning for a, a project or reservation, uh, you know, when, for example, a customer comes in and they purchase a certain number of slots and they pay for it, they want to dynamically adjust that, um, that's a different thing. We have multiple ways to dynamically adjust the, the, the size of reservation. But again, at the query level, uh, things are very dynamic, and the number of slots that are being used very, very rapidly and dynamically change during the execution. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any anybody else? So I'll, I'll ask my question. Well, I had I posed one question earlier, and I listed. You, you, really said, you sent it to me in, as a direct message. You didn't send it to everyone else. Oh, I see. Oops. <laughs> okay. Can you so, go, go for it. Yeah. So regarding your shuffle, so you mentioned that uh, you persist the shuffle uh, so that if there is an old failure, you will get it from there and continue, like the what MapReduce does in a Spark. Uh, but also that is very expensive. So do you persist that in the local cache or you send it all the way to the object store? So as Alex mentioned, uh, we have an in-memory shuffle layer that can persist it in memory, uh, but with certain durability guarantees. And you know, there's obviously always um, some risks that you lose data that's in memory, even if you replicate it and do things like that. Um, but the thing here is that you know, if you reduce the chance of that, uh, then most of the time you don't have to redo the work. But uh, that's a good question. I think uh, this is really the key here, that being able to do in-memory shuffle. Otherwise, the cost of core execution would be very, very high. OK, um, so my first question is, uh, you know, the Dremel paper was 2010, so it's 11 years ago. Are there any assumptions that were made in that paper that 
given that BigQuery, you know, it's been operating now as, as a product and it's exposed outside of, you know, the, the where people, people outside of Google are, are now able to use it. Is there any assumptions that were made in that paper in terms of the system design that are, are no longer correct or have been invalidated or you've changed in, in BigQuery since then? I think that's a very good question. Um, so recently, uh, uh, if you know, Dremel won the test of time award after 10 years in VLDB. Yes. And uh, there's a, there's a uh, kind of a short paper that we published that exactly answers that question. What are the things that we assumed at the time and uh, things that actually no longer uh, hold? And I think it's very interesting to go through that. Uh, yes, there were certain assumptions that, that were made into how we handle, uh, you know, nested data, for example, or how we handle execution. Um, and a lot of those changed, but some of it is still very valid. And uh, I think Dremel and BigQuery pioneered that area and still continue to, to do that. So I'm going to refer you to that paper and I can send you a link if you would like. No, sorry, that, that, that was a softball. Like that was, it was queuing, <laughs> queuing you up. All right, sorry. Thank I, you. I, I know, yeah, I know the paper. Um, but actually, so one thing, another question I have is, my last question is, you know, as you said, Dremel was very influential. There's a, there's a bunch of open source clones, right? There's Drill, Dremio, and I guess Impala can claim it as well. Are there any, Part of those systems, or any features or something that those open source systems have done that you guys wish you had in BigQuery, or you saw that now that was a really good, really good idea, and you ended up implementing it as well? Or do you guys still see like BigQuery as the you know state of the art and farther ahead than any of the open source guys? I think uh, I'll take a uh, you know stop at this one, Alex. Please uh, feel free to add your thoughts as well. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of very interesting developments in the open source community, and I don't think we uh, you know BigQuery can claim that it always stays ahead in uh, like in terms of being a state of the art. I, I think some some innovations in the storage data layout formats that happened um, for columnar processing. Um, was very interesting. I mean, things evolved significantly. Again, if we go back in time, you know, 10 years, you know, multiple iterations of how we store data within BigQuery uh, evolved, a lot, but a lot of it, some of it were at least influenced by how things evolved on open source. And then we obviously added things that we felt like are important and are uh, uh, important in terms of query um, processing and perform storage performance. Um, Alex, do you have any kind of thoughts, examples you wanted to add? No, I think you captured it perfectly. Uh, yeah, BigQuery essentially changed quite significantly in the last 10 years. All this dynamic uh, execution, query plan adjustments, uh, those were not part of original Dremel. But uh, we definitely watch, you know, other progress being made, and it looks like we still have very quite a lot of opportunities in analytical data processing to make things better. Of course, that's, that's why they pay a lot of money, right? Because it's, it's, it's always something else to do, it's fantastic. All right, guys, uh, Hussein, uh, Alex, again, I, I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us.